Are you tired of fighting the same old dragons over and over again? Wouldn't you rather fight a new family of dragons, or better yet? Wouldn't you rather play as a new dragon species in your 5e or Pathfinder game? Well, now you can. Roll for Combat, the creators of the incredibly popular Battle Zoo Ancestries Dragons, have done it again with Battle Zoo Secret Dragons. This collection of four dragon books introduces new families of dragons to the world of 5e and Pathfinder. Now you can play as, or fight, the dragon you never knew you needed. Inside each book, players will find complete rules for playing as one of these new, unique dragons, allowing them to unleash new abilities and powers never seen before. Meanwhile, GMs will find pages of monster stats, allowing you to pit these new creatures against your players. Each book features one new family of dragons filled with extensive, in-depth descriptions of their powers and abilities, background and history information, world lore, illustrations, and more to help you introduce these new dragons into your 5e or Pathfinder games. Experience the world of Battle Zoo Secret Dragons through four new books. Fairy dragons are connected with the Fey realm and love to play pranks and cause mischief. That is, when they aren't conspiring with the courts of the Fae. Misfit dragons are hot, magical messes of magical energy, constantly shifting their physical forms, phasing in and out of existence, or simply releasing random wild magic effects. They're quite a handful. Leshy dragons are deeply connected to nature, allowing them to grow alongside different types of plants, fungi and leshies. Oh yeah, and they're master chefs as well. And finally, the powerful battle dragons are obsessed with the thrill of combat. Battle dragons love hunting foes, dueling opponents, or commanding their legions to glorious victory. Head over to kickstarter.rollforcombat.com now to secure your copies of Battle Zoo Secret Dragons and become the dragon you are always meant to be. Hey everyone, welcome to Roll for Combat Live! And we have a special treat, because instead of us talking endlessly about D&D and Pathfinder and role-playing games left and right, we are going to do a side tangent. And we're going to talk about role-playing games, but how do you turn a role-playing game into a board game? Ooh, I've always, Ooh. I've always wondered about that myself, because I've seen it done a few times, but it's starting to get more and more popular, where we have crossovers between board games and role-playing games and other medium and right now chaosium has the call of cthulhu horror on the orient express the board game that is a very very long title and that's for kickstarter that launched yesterday and it's already up to five hundred twenty five thousand dollars and they only have one tier that's it first class ticket for 98 bucks that's it you can get the game you get the whole game for $98. Wait, and Steven, there is a second tier you can spend one dollar. You can spend the plan manager. There's one dollar. Like That's 10 true. Ten percent of people look like they pledge that. Ten percent of people always pledge the one dollar tier, by the way. It's yeah, uh this is the one dollar. Yeah. yeah, it's it's weird actually. It's always ten percent. Anyhow, so we have the designers of the game, and I'm not gonna try to pronounce your names because I'm sure I will get them completely wrong. No offense, just because uh, I, I don't speak Polish. So why don't you say your names and your background so I don't mess this up? <laughs> if you want to go first, Adam. Uh, okay, yeah. So I'm I'm Adam Kwapiński, and uh, I'm one of the designers of uh, on the Orient Express, and I design board games for a long uh, long time. I I play. Uh, RPG before before that uh, a lot and uh, I have a pleasure to design this one with Golomp uh, who will tell about himself more <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Michał Golomp Golombiowski I usually go by Golomp <laughs> which is the way shorter version uh, I'm also the long time designer of board games I've been doing board games for uh, 10 years already and this is the biggest one, which is for me and for now, which is great to be doing with Adam because he's a renowned creator of amazing big board games thematic and bringing stories to, to the board game medium. 
Well, some, what were some of the other ones you've created? I know you did, between the two of you, you've done Nemesis, Frostpunk, and Destinies. And uh, of those, I know Nemesis is pretty popular. I, I see that run a lot at Gen Con, and I know people talk about it a lot. I've played it because it's it's aliens in space. I mean, it's basically aliens. Uh, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's just as brutal if you've never played Nemesis... If you ever watched an Aliens and saw how everyone pretty much dies, that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much Nemesis. You, it's really hard, <laughs> like really yeah, it's hard. It's a game about dying in space. That's, oh. <laughs> let's let's be true. <laughs> what do you do? You die. It's just how then... long do you last before you die? Really? So, I we almost beat it once. I almost we came pretty close, and then someone blew up the ship and killed everyone. So. <laughs> Of course, someone <laughs> always do something like this. That's that's totally normal. Yes, I noticed. So, um, so what I wanted to talk about a little bit with this is that the Call of Cthulhu Horror of the Orient Express is a very popular adventure module, and if whenever you see lists of like the best adventures of all time, this is always listed in there. And the adventure though is gigantic it is actually a box set you can get from chaosium it's so big so how on earth do you take a like 600 page gargantuan adventure and turn it into a two-hour board game like what do you even like how do you even approach this because it's it's just it just seems nearly impossible <laughs> well you know it's mostly about differences between the medium uh, because uh, when you play for me when you play uh, tabletop rpgs it's all about story there's no winning and losing no uh, uh, no that uh, that part of uh, of game it's about uh, creating a story but when you go into a, a board game uh, board games are more uh, mechanical how the engine works how how the game uh, game works when we talk about uh, all the uh, all the stuff uh, inside and uh, what what is important is that uh, we want to keep the spirit of the role playing game and uh, this was our uh, our main idea the spirit of uh, Call of Cthulhu, of investigation, and all all that stuff, uh, and of course uh, with uh, with all important parts from uh, from the horror on the Orient Express campaign, like Orient Express and the uh, vampire and uh, other stuff. Uh, but we don't want to retell the story again because uh, we have different uh, different tools to. Uh, uh, to show people how it uh, how it works, and uh, you know uh, the narrative tool is not exactly the same in the board games. In board games, we use more uh, what I called emergent narrative than uh, just writing a lot of text that people have to have to read to fill the the theme. So uh, it's more about mechanics that will. They let you to imagine what just happened, what your character do, what happened on the train, and uh, and all that stuff. That so mm -hmm. that that was, uh, I think, our uh, our approach. Yeah, so it's more like of an homage than a translation. So it's heavily inspired. It keeps the spirit, but most certainly isn't uh, the same, but different. It's different and it's different. That's <laughs> right. So it has like the feel on the theme, but it's not exactly the same story. Yeah, it's like if you like the Horror of the Orient Express and you like board games, this should be for you. It's not like if you like Horror of mm -hmm. the Orient Express, it's more of the same because Horror of the Orient Express already does that. There is much more of the same there. <laughs> you can have so so much, you can spend so much time on the adventure and it's so well written that mm -hmm. the, the story is so enticing that there is no need for us to expand on it as in, as in retail it. Mm -hmm. It's just better to offer so, a, an experience in the world of Horror of the yeah. Express. Mm -hmm. So real exactly. quick, I'll just give a quick overview because I did get to play it. 
and let's see how much I remember, is that you're an investigator, <laughs> and you're on a train, and the train's very cool, and the train is filled with passengers and suspects, and some of these suspects are trying to call the old ones and do something horrible and kill everyone. And you have to go around the train talking to the suspects and determine if they're innocent or if they're cultists. And you get various clues and abilities and you have to move passengers around the train to fulfill tasks. So the, the investigators go around the train talking to people, moving passengers around the train to convince the suspects to give up information. And at the same time, monsters are attacking the train and killing people. And if too many passengers die, you lose. And I believe if you get, if the train makes it to, I don't I forgot how it, what happens if the train, we never got all the way to the end. Uh, but, um, and the passengers also <laughs> change. No one ever does. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the passengers' moods change. So sometimes they're scared. Sometimes they're terrified. Sometimes they're passive, or you know. So they're going in different levels of insanity, and then you can change in their moods. And when they die, you put them in a little coffin, which was my favorite part. It was a little coffin you put them in, and that's basically the game. Did I get it right, more or less? Yeah, it's it's exactly what uh, what you said. Uh, right, we are that. in a dreamland. We have evil cultists. We are on the train, and we try to figure out, you know, who is the cultist and who's uh, who's not. So, right. yeah. So I did forget. Right, you're on a train, and then suddenly you're no longer on Earth. You're you're now yeah. like in. Uh, in the dreamlands. In the dreamlands, right. And then you're going yeah, to the dreamlands. Yeah, we use some part of the original mm -hmm. campaign where mm -hmm. this also can happen during the uh, Orient on the Express mm -hmm. uh, RPG campaign. So we choose that dreamlands will be perfect for, for mm -hmm. us to, uh, you know, to make something that uh, mm -hmm. you can play many times with different, uh, different settings, but it's still on the dreamland. So it's... Uh, uh it's good uh, good place to uh to create a, a board game about so yeah and it also g gives us some leeway uh in terms of mechanical things that can happen there because mm -hmm. we uh, strive for l let's say uh like uh, like a feeling that what's happening is f like uh, proper or real in the terms of w w what happens like when we're fighting monsters People are small and the monsters are big, so we're not actually able to kill them. So we're just pushing them off, pending them the, off the train, and they're just falling down the, the train cars. Mm -hmm. uh, so we tried to stay true to the narrative, and the Dreamlands give us a bit more of a leeway to mm -hmm. do that. Because oh, there's a bit much more possible. <laughs> I did forget to mention that you do level up and get new skills and abilities, so you can yeah, replay this. Dozens, hundreds of times, and it's never the same game, which I did like. So there was a lot of slots for changing the characters. So there, it was always different. It was, uh, it was also very compact. I was kind of surprised in this day and age where I'm playing games that take up my entire freaking room, and like this was, <laughs> this was a small game, which actually I was very impressed. I was like, it just took up almost like a, a crazy small amount considering how much was going on <laughs> which which was which was a nice change as opposed to the games i've been playing i never heard this term before a gamma people were calling them cinder block games because of the size and weight of a cinder block <laughs> well, i haven't yeah, heard yeah, it yeah, either right. but it fits yeah, it is yeah. so i was like that's correct they are cinder block games that's true it's like a baby cinder block this game it looked big but it very it set up very it was just one board and just a little bit and that was it it really wasn't that much so yeah we try to make this game also uh elegant and approachable mm -hmm. because uh you know sometimes uh, we know that a lot of people who play mostly rpg can be interested uh, playing game like this mm -hmm. uh even if they don't have a uh, lot of experience with the board games so giving them something really really crazy big uh, is is not a great idea you know if they yeah play... they would just bounce off mm -hmm. yeah exactly so uh, so it was uh, it was uh, also an important part of uh, of our work well the other thing that's cool is that there's an actual train on the board like a 3d train 
and there's a little mechanic mark where like the windows are open and you literally slide the curtains across the windows to open and close them because if you look outside uh. you might go insane and there's yeah. a vampire that hangs off the train and like kills people like reaches it literally reaches in the window and pulls people out and kills them and that's fun <laughs> i mean not if you got killed but it's fun well you don't die this is the passengers who get killed i mean i oh, guess you could die too perfect it's yeah, good well. it doesn't have player elimination it just has a sort of a death clock that's well i um... think the players can get eliminated too oh, we did... there you go then you, you also die <laughs> everyone can die everyone dies <laughs> no you can go insane you can oh, go right. insane as a... you can go insane but the, okay. then the game ends so it's not like people yeah. play without you for so, okay. Yeah, other that people cannot sense. win if their friends go insane. That's, uh, the, you know, this is teamwork. So uh, seems rude. It's a lesson <laughs> for real life too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so so, but anyhow, it does look cool because you have this actual real train, like a like with, you know, it's not just this two D board. It actually looks it looks like this three D board. So when you designed it. How do you determine, you know, it's one thing to even make a game that has one dimension or two dimensions, but how do you decide, okay, we're going to have an actual train? Is that Chiosium that comes back and says, yeah, we can actually print it? Or is that, how do, who decides that? <laughs> <laughs> I will give I will give this uh, this one to uh, to Michael. <laughs> so this is uh, very much um, <laughs> my favorite part. I'm very much into theatricals and board games. Okay. very much into board games being toys on top of like the game for sure needs to be an amazing game like that that, that that's a given it needs to play play neatly needs to play smooth needs to be approachable but then my favorite part is when the game is uh, good it needs to be fun to toy with it like the curtains you said mm -hmm. the 3d train Everything that happens, the, the vampire hangs uh, hangs uh, off the window mm -hmm. on the on the wall of the train, like the coffins you put on of the on top of them. So it's part of the uh, like another tool in the board game uh, in the board gaming medium that you can do like the sh the show don't tell uh, story uh, way of uh, ex explaining the story. Mm -hmm. uh, where obviously when the passenger dies and we remove them off the, the train. It's obvious what happened, but then when you keep them in the coffin, we also have this like a lingering, uh, like a remnant of the, the thing happening there. So uh, we also try to do so many things uh, that happen to stay with us within the game so that we can recall recall them and just feel like, oh, how fast the person died or oh, the thing happened. And you can still see it there after some time. So the 3D very much helps with it to, for the game to like literally pop up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and to be uh, to be honest, it's uh, it's great when you create a game and uh, you can give some gimmick uh, to the game, but the gimmick also works uh, in terms of mechanic, uh, like you said about curtains. Uh, we cannot do that without 3D train. There's no way to uh, you know make a, a curtains looking like uh, like this. So it gives you new possibilities and uh, and to be honest i i think that 3d train was one of the first idea i think this was the one thing that we know uh, from star that okay we need a train in uh, in this one yeah it's uh, because to be honest uh, in the campaign the train is one of the main character when you uh, when you look at the campaign this is uh, this is character itself in in the uh, in the campaign, this is how important it is. So, yeah, we want we want a trade. Hmm. So, and also, like when you when you play uh, tabletop RPGs, it's uh, not, not uncommon at all to have a like a like actual 3D map with like like with some I don't know obstacles or stuff happening around. Mm -hmm. And have your character minis. So this also helps to bring this uh, to the RPG vibe in because mm -hmm. you can export it also the other way you could play you could use this on the rpg without the mechanical event uh, mechanical rules imposed by our board game mm -hmm. just for the narrative story part of organizing stuff i will say the uh the the first time you put a coffin on a passenger was it's so much fun 
That is, I have not. <laughs> I play a lot of board games, and I never saw that. And the coffin fits perfectly over them, and then they just sit there, and you have the little coffin. I love that. That was that was worth it alone. Just putting, just, <laughs> just doing that. <laughs> it's really fun. I was, I was like, because they're so tiny, and then they just it fits perfectly. It's like dink. There's little coffins sitting there on your train, and then you're like, <laughs> you know, okay. We see, it, uh, <laughs> we see this a lot when we show the game to people, and people have. So much fun putting uh, those passengers into coffins that uh, I'm a little worried about humanity. <laughs> look on the, uh, smile on their faces. It talks something about us. It's fun. Maybe yeah. they are destined to be morticians when they grow up. It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> Well, it just, yeah, to be honest, it's fun. It looks so neat. Well, it, what, it, well, there's a lot on the train because there's a lot of there's a lot on the train, and there's all the characters and all the passengers. But then the coffins stick out, so you know how many have died. As you said, it's like you see like see three coffins, and I think if you have seven, the game ends. Um, yeah. Yes, so exactly. wow, look at that! I really had a good memory for this. I only played it once, <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it must have been intuitive in a way that you picked it up and remembered it. Uh, it must have That's been a sign of a good design. Yeah, it must have been. I mean, yeah, seriously, it was in a noisy gamma game hall where there's like ten thousand other people playing games, but I still was able. That's how much I wanted to play. That's how interested I was that I paid attention. <laughs> and then the vampire man, that vampire was nasty. <laughs> that guy's running around pulling people out of the train. So what's the what's the process of like you designed so what's the process of designing a board game? So we design role playing games, we design even card games, but I've never done okay, that's not true. I designed a board game in fifth grade. I had to read the book The Pearl. And then I we had to do mm-hmm. a, something creative. And some people wrote stories. Some people wrote uh plays or music. I designed a board game. And so that was the first and nice. last one I ever did when I was ten years old. I've never done one since. So, like, how do you test it? Like, how, like, what is the process for this? Yeah, to to be honest, it's uh, uh, always a little different because uh, each game is uh, unique and uh, it needs uh different uh, different attitudes uh but in uh, in case of uh, uh games i love to start with the some uh important ideas what we want to uh create in terms of uh emotions and feelings for example here as you said at the uh, beginning we want to uh show the vibe of uh, tabletop rpg on the board so uh we have a couple of uh, of things that uh, we know will be very important for us for for example one of the uh, in my opinion uh, when you try to tr- translate rpg on a board game uh it's hard to uh avoid the game about fighting uh, you know all games especially about fantasy game uh, when you have a fantasy game on uh, on board and it's uh, uh it's close to the rpg but it's you have only your characters and your opponents and nobody else there's no uh, yeah let's just, just do the swords and armors and let's fight uh, yeah <laughs> exactly and and uh, i i love rpg i i play a lot of uh, uh of tabletop rpgs and for me it's more about talking for example yeah it's uh, this is the the important part you talk to many uh, many different characters uh, in the game so we want to uh, show this we want this train to be crowded we want this train to give you uh, give you uh, the feel of investigation not only kill everybody you see uh, but uh, but try to figure out something uh, and uh, and those uh, uh, those were the was the pillars of uh, of our design at uh, at start. And to be honest, when we start talking with uh, uh, with Goomp, uh, it it was very very fast when we came up with idea and the other person give you another one with uh, with uh, uh, his own approach. Uh, uh, I think uh, the the first couple of hours when we create the 
uh, the pillars of the game was really crazy creative and uh, yeah it it was it was great uh, and fast yeah the, the one thing we uh, we the one thing we think about also which is very similar in saying but also a very uh, different in like for for other people to to think about it is if i bought the horror and lyrics the, the board game what would i expect there to be and this is also one of the important things that we cannot fail because we are doing a thing based on another thing for a group of people that already expect something even though the game is not there there's no not not anything about it already the expectation is there like it's already in the express it kind of expect the train there to be <laughs> it's horror yeah. we expect to be the players to be uh, the players to be investigators and so on and so on so there's so many things that are like enforced on us just by the choice of both the medium and the story we're telling hmm. Yeah, there is always already imagination of a game before you even start creating the game. It's like uh, it's like talking about dragons. Uh, you know, nobody see a dragon in a real life, but everybody know how dragons looks like. So when you want to describe a dragon, people have expectation and uh, they want to see what they have in their in their head. And this is kind of similar when you create a game that adapts something. Yeah, if you don't meet their expectation, if you don't capture like exactly that moment that people remember, they're going to feel some kind of friction. They're going to feel like it's off. Like thinking of another spooky train, like uh, because it had it, I think the 30 year anniversary the other day in Final Fantasy VI, you can suplex a train. So if there was a board game of that and you couldn't suplex the train, I think a lot of people will be like, what's going on? Why can't Sabin suplex the train? That's like yeah. my favorite thing that I happened on the train. You have to know what those moments are. You have to be able to deliver what people want to see. Yeah, exactly. The the iconic parts of the thing you try to adapt have to be there. Yeah, that's uh, this is uh, I feel that uh, especially strong with the strong uh, frost punk and the generator and, uh, you know, it, it was a big tower in the video game and we know we have to put that tower into a board game because everybody expects that i see so so obviously you do have constraints it's not like you just come up with a game out of nowhere you obviously had something to base this off of which is the train and then you have the passengers and then their investigators so you had the bones were kind of there ahead of time and so you were able to design around that. But then how do you test it? Because it requires so much testing and games and like, who do you test it with? How do you test it? Um, I'm just curious what the process is for something like so this. So I'm testing it with this guy. <laughs> That's it? Just both of you back and forth? No, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of a joke, but sort of not. Uh, and, and the very first thing we did we just dumped all of our ideas into like physical components that were like completely uh, not final like in any way, like empty cards, empty components, mm -hmm. just like just just some stuff. And like I'm, I don't know, I'm like moving around and I'm like talking to someone and like mm -hmm. just uh, play pretend with the components mm -hmm. and create them as as we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so... always always different phase of testing. Yeah, and the, the first phase is uh, to be honest uh, in your head when you uh, try to uh, imagine how it will uh, work. Uh, then you create the first prototype, as as Michal uh, uh, said, the the prototype without uh, without an illustration, graphic design, and all that stuff. It's only for for us, so it's mostly white cards with text and that's all uh, uh, and uh, then you uh, you test it on uh, on yourself because you want to check how the game uh, game works how the whole engine uh, uh, works in uh, in that game uh, and you can test it uh, partially. Uh, you don't have to test on that stage the whole game always, but we can test, okay, what we can do with the passengers, what can happen with them. 
and then you check what kind of components work better on uh, uh, to represent something. Like uh, when we talk about passengers, we know that something will happen to them, yeah, and uh, probably something more than just dying. So coffins uh, were not enough, uh, and we are looking. Okay, we don't want minis here because uh, those are not so important uh, characters in the game. Uh, and we decide to uh, move to dice because dice have six faces, and this is how we can show the mood of passengers. Uh, with uh, literal faces. <laughs> yeah, we have literal faces, exactly. So we, uh, you, you try to find, uh, you know, perfect representation for what you, uh, what you have in mind, and uh, and you can test this in uh, in different uh, in separate parts. But after that, of course, the the real testing and uh, it start for us uh, uh, with friends, of course, and and people from Chaosium and uh, Kuba, who is one uh, who started the project. Uh, to to be honest, and was the spiritus movens of uh, of that idea. Uh, but after after that, there was a. Uh, Gen Con, the first time we presented the game to people we don't know, and uh, and this is super super important because uh, uh, this time you have expectation about your uh, own game, and you try to check if the game uh, is is good enough, if it's work like you think it. And it is never work. is. And it never is. That's uh, uh, that's true. Uh, uh, so. Uh, you have to be humble because people will use your game a little different than you think they will use it. So, uh, uh, but this is exactly how, you know, like being dungeon master in uh, RPG. Players will always do something else. No matter how many ideas you have, no matter how many paths you create, they will choose the next one, the, the one that you don't imagine uh, can be chosen. So, uh, yeah, the, dif the yeah. difficult difference is uh, in RPG you're there to fix it. In a board game, we're not in the box. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That, that's true. But uh, but Gen Con and testing the game there show us that uh, uh, people have fun playing this game. Uh, people have uh, those emotion we want, and of course we see lots of things that uh, uh, that we have to. Uh, change, fix in the game, and polish uh, different uh, different things. But uh, overall, uh, it was uh, it was what we want, and uh, we see that okay. In the uh, when we look at the big picture, this this was the game people think it will be before they uh, sit and play. So yeah, we we were uh, super super happy. Uh, it was four day of. Uh, Playing on two tables, one uh, uh, one with Go on the second with me. Sometimes Cuba changes just to give us a little break, but we get a lot of feedback from from there. And uh, I think from that moment we we were super excited because uh, before we are excited inside and there with with people uh, who who see the game. Yeah, it was it was great. So how do you determine how hard the game should be? Because this game, like you keep saying, oh, you don't win. You know, <laughs> you, 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 like how hard is too hard? Because don't you want people to win once in a while? Uh, you know, or is it just, yeah, I mean. Okay, okay. Uh, so for, for sure we it should be different, We have a little, a little different uh, uh, approach to this, but... Uh, there is a joke that uh, I make really uh, games that are hard to win. Uh, Goomp is, uh, uh, is a little uh, not so cruel to, uh, to players. I mean, I, I enjoy winning, so... <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, but to, be, to be honest, for me, what is important is that when you play cooperative game, it has to be a little harder because you don't have a physical opponent. So it has to be a challenge. You don't, uh, when you play a game like this and you win first time you play easily, 
this is boring. To be honest, this is boring. You, mm. The challenge has to be there. Uh, but I think this is the, uh, the only part that uh, I'm right. And sometimes I push it uh, a little <laughs> too, too much on the side where it's really hard to win. But it, this time... Uh, uh, this time uh, I have uh, I have go on on my side and he uh, he stops me for doing nasty nasty things uh, to players so you can win the game and this is because uh, go on uh, uh, was co-designer here. You know, as someone who enjoys hard difficulties myself, but also likes to get other people to play with me in cooperative oh. games. I appreciate um, games like Spirit Island, where it's like the tutorial difficulty is ridiculously easy. You will definitely win unless your group is really doesn't know what they're doing. And some groups don't and lose their first game. I've heard about that, too. But there are like 50 levers that you can pull to be like, oh, now I'm I'm facing against like rank five Germany and we're also on the harder board and we're also doing this weird scenario where we have to like spend extra energy on the borders of the map or something like that. And then it gets harder and harder. I appreciate that because I can lure people in with the easier one that they win the first <laughs> time and feel better about themselves. I'm like, okay, great. Now we can, now we can just play this really hard one next. You got it now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so what actually happened in the game is uh, our desired difficulty that we created uh, after so, so many playtests, <laughs> where we added some levers to uh, lower the difficulty. There, there, there's a way of adding tokens to the bag. And now the difficulty that we always play is called proper difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are the easier ones called normal and easy that are still difficult don't get me wrong in, in here uh, but the, the way we intend the game to be played is uh, is the way we, we play it but also uh, for people that are significantly better than us at board games we offer an additional challenge of ramping up the difficulty <laughs> I feel <laughs> To the point of near impossibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's exactly exactly true. And uh, uh, you know, of course, it's also part of adaptation because uh, Horror on the Orient Express is uh, the bad fame about how many uh, characters die on this train is uh, quite well known. Uh, so we cannot make it very easy. To be honest, it will be. Uh, it will be not uh, not a good adaptation, uh, but also uh, when you uh, said about Spirit Island, uh, this is one of the cooperative games uh, we both uh, uh, like really, very much. really enjoy, and we we think this is great design. So uh, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was uh, one of uh, uh, of our inspiration when we talk about uh, for example difficulties level or uh, the way you cooperate with other people to avoid alpha player problem uh, and other things like like that so yeah we we play it literally a couple of months before we start designing current express and and we like this game awesome. yeah also spirit island is great for showing the replayability as in the core game plays Somewhat similar, like when I played one Spirit Island playing again, it's not that much more difficult as in learning the rules, but then changing the spirit, changing the the things changes a lot. So we, when we change investigators in our game, each investigator has their own special skill set, very much like creating characters in an RPG. Uh, we have a ritual that sets up the narrative. We have a changing landscapes. So many small changes that ramp, ramp up the great change to how you should approach the problems and not what the problems are. There's a finite number of problems, so you quickly get familiar with them. But the puzzle stays fresh for a long time. That makes sense, because when you're in a really constrained situation, the harder it is, the more that one little element shaking up the numbers on you means that you have to completely change your strategy if you want the best chance of winning. Yeah. 
But if it's easy, you might be able to find a strategy that's like good enough that even as things change around you, you can still usually win. But when it's hard, you will have to really pay attention every time. So what about though? So one of the advantages or of this game is that your characters level up in different ways. The passengers or the suspects could have different. It, there's a lot of variability to the game. The game is very different every time you play. But how do you balance that? And one of the things I keep seeing in the board game space, and this keeps happening, is that a game will come out, and then like a year later, they come out with the updated version of the game, the rebalanced version <laughs> of the game. That, that's happening a lot. Yeah. And then yeah. they do another Kickstarter for the rebalanced yeah. version. <laughs> and I keep getting so, the yeah. upgrade kits because I keep doing that. So how? What, what's is that just necessary? Is that just you, you really need... You know people to play it so they can find all the weaknesses and then you can rebalance it or is that just a necessary evil or what do you think so uh that's the thing uh it actually bounces up what we just said just before starting the stream uh on how early we announced the game that is in the ropes so it's uh, it's being uh, done and played mm -hmm. We want to do the game already as in the, <laughs> let's call it second edition after the patch version. Mm -hmm. We want to play the game so much and know it so well mm -hmm. that we skip and avoid, uh, let's say most, like it's all, all, never, never possible to test all of the combinations, everything, but we want to play the game so much and have so much play testing that uh, we can confidently say that there are no major flaws, no, no, no major problems. And also when we spend so much time with the game, we also both, Adam and I, get a very uh, intricate uh, way of knowing what is good and what is bad. Uh, so it, it, when we even like, we now uh, are creating a new, a new character for the game, uh, there, is, there is already some kind of a, an intuition on how strong things should be, which things are important. And then we'll obviously play Play the hell out of it. <laughs> uh, there are different two of ways. Us and other playtesters. Yeah, there are different ways uh, of balancing games. Yeah, you can just test the game, and uh, of course, you should do this. But also, you can uh, uh, you can count some things uh, uh, before that, and we use a lot of uh, Excel and uh, you know some statistics, some uh, assumption how. Uh, uh, for example, how long the game should be. Uh, mm -hmm. We we can uh, have uh, we have our intuition, but then before we start testing, we can count some things: uh, how many uh, turns there will be uh, in game. Uh, what what does it mean? Uh, uh, how uh, because in cooperative game you have uh, uh, two things that uh, in the game that will pull it one uh, on one side on another. First, you do things that uh, make uh, uh, situation better. And the second thing is that the game push the game uh, off road, uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can tell. And uh, uh, we have to balance it because of course your character will uh, get experience during the game. You will be stronger, you will get new tools to uh, do things, but also and game. you as a player will get stronger. Yeah, and also you, you will understand the game uh, the game better. So you also have to build this on the uh, game uh, game side. Yeah? The game uh, has to be faster, stronger, uh, more, more powerful. Uh, because uh, it's important to have, uh, uh, have good dynamics through the whole game. It cannot be... Uh, too easy at the end because again what is the most uh, uh, important thing we should avoid is boring game uh, people can uh, uh, can really uh, play any kind of game and have fun of it but they can play something they are bored uh, with so uh, yeah yeah so uh, one of our goals is when when the, we feel players are winning we should help them win as quickly as possible. And if we feel like players are losing, which is more often the case, we should kill off the game. Like, as you said, when we have the seven coffins and we're losing the game, we could stretch it out to 10 to 15 or anything. 
But we already know that if you have seven coffins, you're already done, actually. Like, there is no way for you to win. So there is uh, no need for you to spend. So like, it's famously the case of the Monopoly, the game, where you already have fewer money, you already have uh, fewer, uh, fewer uh, the properties, and then you still have to spend an hour or so just waiting to be killed off. <laughs> and it's so much not fun. Also, uh, the, one, one thing making up the balancing, there is also one cool thing, uh, like doing like some of self-balancing things that we can make the game, uh, let's say, know what state it is in and help it push towards the desired difficulty. Like if something is too strong, we can just uh, count it and... Uh... So what about... Yeah. I was curious about the expansion pack so this actually comes with an expansion so yeah. <laughs> how do you decide what's in the core game and what should even be in an expansion or did you have so much material that you had to cut it out and then you added it to expansion and i presume you have like five more ideas of things you can do but oh, 100 <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> even more did... <laughs> see this split was uh, sort of easy we want the core game to be the game like you get the game you get the core game that's it that's the perfect game you play it the way it's intended there are no quirks no weird stuff no hidden rules no anything just play the best of the best games we ever done this is the core box with all the components needed for the perfect experience mm. and then we found out that it's super cool uh actually in this very setting that we have uh, players being the investigators and the suspects on the train being also fully fledged characters, that we could easily swap these things around. So we could offer players to play with the suspects and the investigators that are usually the players to be used as the suspects. Uh, so swapping pieces, like classic TTRPG, swapping PCs and NPCs and meeting your heroes or playing as the other characters. As you said, uh, Mark, you're, uh, you've just wrote a book about playing with the dragons instead of playing against the dragons so this is pretty much the very same concept <laughs> that you did uh as in we've met them already i want to be them Wait. so this is, this is totally not necessary for the base game to be played but it's a super cool fun expansion that expands both the replayability and just the options that are there so wait is it, that mean i'm going to get to play the the vampire in one expansion uh, not no. this one, uh, yeah. but uh, 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 yeah, not now. Oh, <laughs> yeah, not now. Uh, see, now that would be know, fun because then you can win all the time because you kill everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but the vampire character is uh, restricted for us because <laughs> as a designers, we want to feel that. Uh, mm. But uh, but to be uh, to be honest, it's. Uh, uh, what uh, Goam said here uh, about uh, the core game uh, is uh, we don't know how many times people want to play the core game, but we want to give them the best experience when they play first time, second time and third time. But for people who uh, really love the game, they want replayability. And uh, exactly it's, uh, again, a uh, similar thing like in the uh, case of, uh, of Spirit Island. You have uh, a little simple uh, spirits uh, in terms of uh, mechanism and all the stuff, but when you look at the expansion, they are crazy things they can do. Uh, but uh, you don't want to give those difficult spirits to players who are new in the game because... Uh, it will be because they could take them for the first game and not have fun. Yeah, and oh, yeah. this is exactly exactly what we uh, have here. So the uh, 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 the investigators from this uh, expansion will be a little weird uh, in terms of uh, mechanics, uh, and it's uh, it's better to put them into the expansion because probably people will play with the core game first time, and it will be easier. Uh, them to understand everything we uh, yeah also don't don't get us wrong in here the base game is already crazy replayable i mean like there is easily 50 to 100 very much different playthroughs that you will not get bored so 
if you're still hungry for more after the 50 games, then this expansion uh, that, ah, oh, let's self-promote comes for free with the Kickstarter now. <laughs> so every every pledge, like you said, there is only one pledge uh, for $98. You just get it and you get also the uh, expansion. Uh, it's already there uh, for people. But if uh, for the sh sh people shopping uh, and learning for the game for the like the more brick and mortar uh, style, uh, the perfect game should be already there in the, in the core box. So you can that play. Makes sense. You'll be able to play as the different characters, maybe the monsters. Will you ever be able to get to play as the train? Ooh. <laughs> Keep that idea, you know. Oh, like... he's thinking. He's thinking it through. There you go. Yeah. I want to circle back to something that you were discussing earlier because I would say Spirit Island is probably my favorite cooperative game. But I would say that the death spiral or wind spiral problem that you were talking about earlier and trying to make sure it's done quickly is a really cool idea. And I would say of Spirit Island has like dozens of strong points i don't want to have to get into here but one of its weak points i would say is that you can have a relatively lengthy ramp during which you definitely are going to win and i found that that more inexperienced players don't even know that but i do where they're just mm -hmm. like they're worrying and they're i don't know what should i do and i'd be like calm down we're, we're we've already won we're already there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. the moment that this person uses that power on that city the game is over and we won we yeah. even won last round uh really no matter which place they went to we had it completely under control mm -hmm. so what specific techniques did the two of you use in this game to ensure that the wind spiral or death spiral were shorter so if you were going to win that it happens relatively quickly and if you're definitely on the down that you die fast and you don't just like cling to life for an hour d desperately clawing a uh, cup so yeah so i'll start with wind spiral and adam will talk about the his favorite spiral <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah uh so uh for winning uh there are two things first uh, the game uh is a twofold thing first thing you have to survive through the whole journey and the second thing you have to solve a uh Pretty neat puzzle. I mean, uh, we've designed, and I'm super proud of what we designed. We designed a uh, deduction puzzle that is uh, both uh, like procedurally generated, but then again, it's fresh every time you play. We've played uh, so many times together with Adam, and we still, when we approach the puzzle, we still have to think through what are the good options or the bad options. And uh, so, uh, I haven't had a game yet where I was so far in front of the game that I was both safe from the from the problems within the, the, the on the train and have no the deduction. So, uh, uh, so for the wind spiral, it's uh, usually like the game is kind of uh, by design cut short, so that even if you're winning, you are still in the need of progressing the puzzle and making it even more sure even better uh, so yeah so the, for, for the winning i am pretty sure there's not not a way to learn everything and have many spare turns at tops one or two which is very cool it's just you that you just do like the final push and yeah and the game still pushes you like there is uh, as adam said before there's a ramping up difficulty uh, uh through the game so even if you're in a good spot if you just uh, take a breath, the game could still catch up <laughs> on you. So you have to keep an eye on everything. Because as you said, in Spirit Island, there's this uh, turnover point where you're controlling the game. Here is not. There is no magic moment after which it's easy. Hmm. Yeah, we just put that moment, uh, you know, after the game ends. Uh, when you look on the <laughs> track, the moment is <laughs> on, on the right side. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, what, what Michal uh, said here is uh, is the, totally true. So the two sides of game give this uh, uh, gives this thing that you uh, cannot be sure that you uh, win too early. It's not like sitting one hour after you uh, know that 
the game is uh, already won. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second one about losing, there are, I think, two uh, important uh, part of that. First, uh, when you lose, it cannot happen uh, from nowhere. You have to see it coming. It's uh, uh, because when you when you lose uh, uh, immediately, it uh, it's frustrating. It's not the way we uh, uh, you want to you want to lose the game. So uh, we have to show you, and we use different pools. For example, when we talk about coffins, uh, it's not about that. In one move, you will lose all seven passengers uh, yeah. because you have seven coffins. No, probably you will lose one, two in uh, on other turn. Uh, and when you see that you have only two coffins left, you know that it can happen any time, and you have to be super focused on that part. Uh, so this is the one thing. And the second thing, it's important that when the game know that you already lose it should happen quite quickly. Uh, you shouldn't uh, have opportunity to play another hour just to uh, game tells you that you lose, uh, uh, lose very early. So uh, we, we give lots of uh, different things you can, uh, you can try to, uh, to get during the game. You can, uh, I don't know, even if it's going very badly, you can go uh, and uh, try to find some artifacts or uh, look for a new spell and things that break uh, just the rules. Do a side quest. Uh, yeah, there, uh, there are different, uh, different quests uh, from, from the suspects. So uh, even if you see that there is uh, no hope, you can do something and probably uh, it will uh help you a little or kill you very quickly this is uh, this is how it works yeah because when I you uh, you know when you cast a spell you will lose some sanity and probably the sanity will kill you if the spell doesn't didn't help you enough to uh, change your situation so yeah, i think is, is we have the... yeah yeah uh, i'm, I'm going to try to summarize it and see if i get it right so mm -hmm. it sounds like for the losing side they're built into the game high risk, high reward strategies that you have to use if you're about to lose or you definitely will lose. And when you use them, they will either finish you off and so it's over or they'll take you back into the game and out of the death spiral. And so you can keep playing and then you'll know which one that is. And on the winning side, you never really know that you've won just because of how many brutal things that the game can do. So you can get a, uh, a win spiral because you don't have a condition like Spirit Island where you can just stop in the middle and not have to see those turns where they're double exploring yeah. everywhere. You always have to go through that. Yep. Yes. Yeah, one thing is that also helps. We have uh, plenty of ways of losing. Uh, so it's very helps. important. Uh, 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 it's both fun uh, on the design, but it's also uh, very helpful on, on uh, keeping the players in, in track because it first helps us to to know which part is the the pushing part for the players to grow. As they like when they lose b because they lost the essence, they know oh the next time we need to keep track of the essence and they learn it. And since we have like seven or eight ways of playing, uh, losing. It's enough for eight games of growing the players <laughs> just before they learn the, the ropes, yeah. That yeah, makes this sense. Is, this is uh, sometimes really beautiful when uh, people play the game and lose because, for example, coffins and uh, after the game tell us, okay, well, the, game is, uh, the game is very fun, it's great, but I think it's all about coffins. And they play another time and we, they focus on coffins. They don't lose anyone. And they are brutally killed because of the essence uh, pool is uh, is empty. And uh, uh, yeah, this is learning curve, uh, what we call it in games. I've experienced that fun. a ton in um, these kind of games. It's like always fighting the last battle. Yeah, where yeah. <laughs> it's like that's what got. Oh, it's essence. Never mind. No, oh, we'll only focus on essence. It's like no, you gotta you gotta balance things. Yeah. Eventually, you'll learn. <laughs> So when is a game done, though? Like, 
If 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 you never it's released, never done, Steven. I know, but no, well, always working. evolving. They're about well, people playing them. No way, yeah, wait. but Let, that's true. That's true. Game is never never done. It's only published. But they have the publishing that's, date then. No, <laughs> but my point is, no, let me rephrase that. Because it's a board game, because it has expansions, the game is coming out, and there's one expansion. If you only had those one expansion in the game itself, would you be happy? Or are there, like, a few extra rules and things you really want to add to the game, and then you feel like it's done done? Like, do you feel like, oh, yeah, just if mm. you played the core game and you never even played with the expansion, that's all you ever need, and it's fine? Or do you feel like, no, it would really be cool if we added all this extra well, monsters? And That's a very interesting question. Yeah. yeah I, I would one. say we are, even though we have so many ideas for expansions, modules, uh, cool stuff, I would say we are aiming for the core box to be uh, the game, as in... If I had to choose, I would say I want to play for the first, second, third time the core box, and this would be the game that w would be the best, mm -hmm. and only then grow on as a as a, like like it's with every other medium. As I get accustomed to it, something I like it very much. I want more of the same, and the only way of doing more of the same is getting expansions, getting anything. Uh, but like I know, watching I don't know, the Matrix, one of my favorite movies. I really like it, but then after 50 or so, some some uh, watches, I want it more. And I and then it's like, as a designer, I want to offer more and I have more, but the perfect one is still the the, the, the very first one. And the very first time you, you, you see it, and the second, actually in the second time, <laughs> when you know what, what it's about, and then you see what you have seen. Huh. Yeah, but it's all also hard because of one more uh, thing, the time, because uh, uh, we spend a lot of time of, uh, when we create a game. And after that, there's a long process of producing, uh, making all the uh, graphic visual stuff and uh, shipping it to people. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we have new ideas during that. And, uh, you know, when, uh, when you see your game after four or five years, you can be proud, you can think that this game is great. But if you don't think that you can fix something, you can change something, it means that, uh, uh, that you are not evolving as a designer. Because probably five years from now, we can create a little better game. Like, uh, that's, that's normal. Uh, so when I look on my uh, shelf with, uh, with my own games, there's uh, no game that I don't... Oh, it's actually, that's everything that's behind Adam is his games. <laughs> not true, not true. Uh, but no, it's, uh, it's never that uh, after a couple of years, you don't uh, want to change even a small thing. You know, even if one of my favorite games from Vlada Hvatil, Through the Ages, they have three editions of it. And the second one was really great. And they still can improve it in the third one a little, just a uh, couple of uh, little changes. So I think if a uh, great designer as uh, Vlada Hvatil uh, have to, or have uh, ideas how to change uh, his games, yeah, we, we will also uh, have some because it, it's how it works. Hmm. Uh, that, that is very true, though, because it's like you finish the game and it takes like a year to produce, and then all that time you're thinking of ways to improve it or change it or add to it. It's, it's true in any game design. Oh, I know. Like, people With, always yeah. ask, like... <laughs> In tabletop RPGs, like when are you thinking of like things you might do differently in another edition? Um, when is that gonna start? They always wonder. It's like we've already even the like, the moment you send it to the publishers, yes. there's usually one or two things that you're like, I could have changed that, but it's too late now because that'll change things twelve other places in the book and we yeah. have to send it today. That was a really good idea. Oh well, like you, see, it's yeah. often like the very same day that there's something that you would think of doing the next time. Like game designers always want to change things and always want to refine and do things the best. I think, or at least most of us do. And you have to get 
some pushback from other parts of the company that are like, you can't just yeah. keep doing that yeah. all the time. Yeah, they they just take the game uh, from us because we will be working on it uh, for uh, infinity. And uh, I think this is common for each creative work because it doesn't matter if you write a book or I don't know, uh, uh, create a song, for example. Probably the moment when the song is recorded, you want to change some riffs and uh, have some new ideas. So yeah, it's it's part of the of the job. So what about? I imagine you guys are pretty excited to have this come out, and you guys can actually then do you then do you go to conventions and like watch people play it or do you ever sit down and play with people do you ever just like go around and looking and seeing all these people playing your game and you're seeing oh yeah and watch and uh get some notes and take some information see how people play it or <laughs> yeah i i love doing that uh i love looking how people uh play the game I don't play my own game after release very often uh, because uh, in most cases I can play uh, uh, those games uh, only with uh, people who are involved in the creation. For example, I suppose that I will have great fun playing uh, uh, Horror on the Orient Express with, uh, with Goop uh, after the release. But it will be hard for me to play it uh, with uh, new people, for example, because uh, of course I I will uh, tell them how to uh, to do what I say to win the game because I'm sorry I'm that kind of uh, mm. player, so I don't play co cooperative games uh, very often. But I love to uh, show the game to people and see how they uh, how they play. That's it's. Fun for me seeing people uh, uh, trying to figure out what to do, discussing uh, 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 when when playing the game. Uh, that's uh, that's really uh, really nice uh, nice thing to do. And yeah, sometimes on convention, um, I can uh, walk uh, uh, walk uh, walk through the convention, look at my game, and stand for a while. Didn't telling people that I'm the designer, and just look how they play uh, and ask what they think because this is the one moment they will be honest with you. Because when they know that you are designer, they can be nice. Where they don't know that you are designer and you're just asking them, okay, how you like the game, you will get a very, very honest response. And sometimes it's uh, good, sometimes uh, it hurt a little, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very good experience in my opinion. Hmm. Okay. Mark, you have any other questions about horror on the Orient Express converting games? We got to get you to play. Mark. Some of my main questions, I think. I gotta, I gotta. Wait, I want to play a game with you guys. I want to play. You can play with us. <laughs> We're good players. <laughs> you know, even to... you sometimes troll the other players. <laughs> okay, so I'm very well known for breaking games. Like I break games badly. Um, but I only do that when I feel like the game should be broken, uh, or if they, if, or if they try to do things you're not supposed to do. Um, but I didn't. Wasn't there a cooperative game where every time you go into another room, more monsters Bard get spawned, and you just kept Bard opening song. doors over yeah. and over? Again? Yeah, yeah. And, and everyone died except you. Yeah, and then you I ran left. away ahead of the monsters, and then all the entire wave crashed into the rest of the party. Yes. Yeah, I well, okay. that's well because they said you win by leaving, and they didn't say you win by everyone leaving. They said you win by leaving. So I was like, okay, then I'm out of here. But like, I took what, it personally, right? Well, then you're supposed to stay there. Like you're supposed to stay there and fight the monsters. I'm like, you didn't say that. You didn't say you. You said I win. So I just kept. I ran to the exit and left everyone behind. And yeah, they yeah. all died. I think you should play. You should play Nemesis more. It's uh, like this type of game. Well, the Nemesis is because Nemesis is part werewolf, and yeah. Uh, yeah, so like Nemesis is the perfect game for me because it's part werewolf and part cooperative and part 
killing aliens. It's very hard. And everyone is messing up with everyone. Everyone's always trying yeah. to screw each other over. So it's it's yeah, great. He only, he only to... wants to survive that. that yeah. Also, your uh, what you said, uh, I think, will fit that that game yes. quite uh, quite nicely. I think it'd be hard to play Social Deduction with Steven because normally when I play Social Deduction games, if someone is blatantly making things terrible for everybody, they're definitely on the side of the bad guys. Steven <laughs> might just do it anyway, so you can't okay. really tell. It's just like this person just screwed things over for the for the bad guys. But that's maybe it was just Steven being Steven. Well, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the point. Well, yeah, but you know what? Nice. Yeah, but then afterwards, so this was at Gamma two years ago, and I played Bard Song with the developers, and I played it that way. And then they all were upset because I, they said no one ever did that. They're like, no one ever did what I did. They said everyone just assumed to play together. And they said they didn't anticipate that. And they were talking about it, and then I saw them the next day on the floor, and they were still talking about it, because they realized that they found it was an edge case they didn't test for, and it actually messed up the game, and it was too late. It was already in production. And that was like, yeah, it was way too late. And it, you know what? I, I wasn't doing it to be snarky. I was doing it because it was an edge case that I they obviously missed, and I wanted to see what happened. And... If I see a game that doesn't really like this game, yeah, you can really mess up this game quite easily, but then you die very fast, and then it's no fun for everyone. So, at least when I played the uh, uh, the Murder of the Orient Express, it wasn't it wasn't a game that you you either all win or you all lose together. But Bard Song yes. was like, "Oh, you win by leaving." Okay. I'm like, well, what happens to everyone else? It's like, well, then they lose. I'm like, well, in that case, <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have done that. You should have just made a very simple way to change that is making you all you all win or you all lose, not, oh, some of you win, some yeah. of you lose. That's That was a mistake of the game design. It's not my problem. It's their fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I think, uh, yeah, I, I will love you as a touch that. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> because we want that kind of information before the game is out, not after that. Oh, <laughs> That's much I, yeah. I break, I really break games. I, I... It'll be like, Steven finds a strategy to push other players into the vampire, and somehow oh, yeah. he does it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I understand that, yeah. Well, keep in mind, also, as a, as a, my day job before this was a, t a software developer, encoder, and testing, and so I'm always going for edge cases and trying to break yeah. things as much as possible, and I'm very, very good at finding how to break stuff. Um, it's not that hard, because especially if you know game design, you know where the edge cases are, so you can test oh, yeah. for them very easily. That's true. Right. That's true. So it's not even that I'm trying to break it, as I see very quickly... Mm -hmm. being a game designer how it can be broken and then test it and yeah, so that... me being a game designer and a former programmer i kind of have this skill also <laughs> so when we design i also try to uh, build in some like s safety stops from like because uh for what i know uh usually uh, it's what you said uh when you do some game breaking stuff it's usually repeating some weird weird things like mm -hmm. repeating weird patterns like you said running between the rooms or something mm -hmm. one, one thing we uh successfully managed to seamlessly incorporate into the orient express uh is players are unable to do the same thing all over again all over mm -hmm. again because mm -hmm. like it's both mechanically impossible and it will like super shorten the game like there's no way for, mm -hmm. to do stuff more than twice or three times in a row and then just you'll be either dead or like but before the game will prohibit you mechanically uh, but not in a harsh way but it's just like uh like you have to do some stuff before you can do the original stuff again yeah. so it, it feels pretty natural that you can you need to rest and so on and, that's game, and that's so there is game not design. an easy way to do like this edge case uh, mm -hmm. bumping. Yeah, well, that's good game design, and that's and that's something natural that you're supposed to put into the game. But you know, it's just the thing is, is that if you don't do it, it's human nature to find it. Like, there's a good oh, yeah. example uh, when EverQuest and share it on forums and share it. <laughs> right, right. There was a there was this thing on on EverQuest. 
And um, I went to, I used to go to um, GDC, the Game Developers Conference. I, I mm-hmm. did like video game development. Yeah. And and one of the best talks I ever went to, and this was, this was literally 25 years ago, like EverQuest just came out. And they were talking about like things they learned through data. And they had one of their towns. And they had two entrances to the town. And then there was the bank, which everyone goes to. And more people were using one entrance to get to the bank than the other one. And they're like, look at the bank. The entrances are here. The bank is exactly in the middle. It should have been 50-50. Like, they built it to be Mm 50-50 so you can go into either entrance. But something like 70, 75% of the people were using one entrance and not using the other one. And they couldn't figure out why. So they did a test, and it turned out that if you use the entrance in the south, it was like 500 steps. But if you use the entrance on the north, it was 502 steps. So it was two steps shorter. And people intuitively figured out, not through anything other than just, it's like a split second faster, that that was the way to do it. And they were Mm -hmm. astounded that it was just you know, like, um, point, you know, 1% faster. And that was the way that the majority of people then used. So it's, it's, it's like, you're thinking, oh, I'm breaking the game. It's like the game, if you don't test for it, someone will figure it out somehow and then share it with everyone. And then the game gets broken anyhow. So yeah, there's no way of unlearning them, the the things like if Mm -hmm. someone tells you, the southern exit is easier like you won't ever go for other stuff like i mean for exploration or something but in general you'll just opt for the better yeah mm-hmm. yeah. yeah water flows downhill like that 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 has been true like in almost any game and that was definitely true in everquest back in the day i remember i used to play it on an enchanter and there was this long quest you were supposed to do in one case to get like a special sacred fish you had to like do five step steps, but mm-hmm. they swim in the pond of the of like the god of justice's temple. Of course, if you killed it there, everyone hates you in the entire world. So, but it was much easier though if you create a paladin of the god of justice. You appear right next yeah. to the pond, yeah. then you kill the fish. Your entire temple like um, excommunicates you and hates you. But then you delete that character and come back in as your original character. And, oh, there is a dead fish that happens to be here. <laughs> oh, look, I'm going to pick that up. And yeah. that was just like the acknowledged way that um, everybody did that. Nobody did the quest chain where you like help the wolf to spit out the fish that had accidentally eaten yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you the best. And then there'll be the last of the EverQuest stories. You know, they had... They had a dragon in the game. I forgot why it was there, but it was supposed to be unkillable. And when I mean unkillable, like, it was unkillable. It had, like, a billion hit points. And the highest AC, everything. And they... One billion is not unkillable. Well, Unless it, it, it's it, not killable per se, well, there's some way to well, do one billion That's damage. exactly what I, I happened. I think in, in Deadlands, they wrote the quote like this. If you give statistic on something, people will kill it. Well, that's what happened. It's like, this was supposed to be unkillable. It took like 20 years, but eventually, people got so powerful in the yeah. game, and they figured out this combo of like resurrecting people, and they figured out the perfect combination and they saw that his hit points were going down ever so slowly. Like they were like, oh, it's gonna die. Like it's like it's gonna take like 10 hours, but it will yeah. die. And yeah. they had this whole coordinated thing where everyone was like bringing and it was like, you know, they spent like months figuring this out. They all got together, they slowly were killing it. And then it was down to like 30% or 20%. And the the devs just turned off the game they just said "Uh uh-oh because they did it was not it was going to break the game if it died so they just they just did a hard restart you can look it up it's famous they're like they're like yeah you're not supposed to kill it it's supposed to be unkillable but they figured out a way to do it and it was going to take like eight ten hours and they were watching them and then after like eight hours they just they pulled the plug 
Yeah, so. but if something like this happens, you you know, the people create their own story. And it was epic, to be honest, when people gather together and figure out and what to... I, uh, I, I think they've cheated a little with the plug off everything. <laughs> well, yeah, people were very angry because, you know, cause the, the, well, the devs supposedly said it would break the game because it was like guarding something and then if they okay. killed it then they would go to an area that wasn't finished you know and so they're like yeah we can't <laughs> okay. have them go there <laughs> you know, so. apparently it was a fan server it was i'm a, looking at was it, it a fan server yes but it was officially sanctioned officially by... sanctioned fan server oh okay still interesting story yeah it's still mm -hmm. well also just the the levels that people go to coordinate to do the impossible and if it, if it's truly impossible then they might not do it but if it's it's like it's like well there's a point oh one percent chance you could do it. it's like so you're telling me there's a chance it's like yes there is a chance it's like well then we're going to figure out how to do it <laughs> and we're going to dedicate a lot of time and effort and they will do it because it's just fun but that but then again that's why i guess as you just put out the game and you test it and you hope and pray there's no huge holes in it and if there is, I guess that's what the erratas are for, right? You change the rules. You say, "Ah, oh, well, here." <laughs> but you try not no, to no, do sometimes, that. Sometimes, sometimes you have to. But uh, to be honest, if you if you test the game, I think you can avoid the big ones. Of course, the smaller mistakes will be always there because the games are big constructs. So it's uh, it's not so uh, so easy to get uh, get all the mistakes. But uh, uh, what is important to uh, uh, to check the big uh, big loopholes and uh, and test it properly because mm -hmm. smaller ones that uh, uh, will be not not a big problem. Uh, people will still have fun with uh, with some small issue but if it's a big one yeah it can destroy the game yeah even a small issue can cause you problems when a game is really tightly designed and difficult because if it winds up creating an unexpected difficulty spike in just a small way it can go from challenging but hard to like impossible uh, yeah yeah that's uh, that's true yeah, that's one, one, one famous way of these things happening slash not happening is when you have run, random stuff happening. Uh, it, uh, one thing, it should never be, it's randomly either good or bad. So it should be either always good or always bad. This is one thing. And the other thing uh, is uh, like we have with our uh, bag of events. It's a, uh, there's a, uh, like there's a timer for everything to happen. So there, there is no chance that like some stuff will never happen. No, everything will happen. So there, we know that eventually all of the things that we we want to happen within the game will happen. The order is variable, the magnitude is sort of variable, but there is not a chance that like you only get to fight the monsters and nothing else happens because then the game could break on its own without our uh, yeah. input. I consider that to be good design because there there are some times that I uh, can feel a little frustrated. Usually I'm just like, ah, whatever, we'll play it again. But I can feel a little frustrated with games that use randomization in such a way that if you peaked, and of course it's hidden information, but if you peaked at some of the things you had randomly drawn, you would realize, oh, we guaranteed can't win. There's literally nothing yeah. that can do yeah. with this. This particular setup was, you know, maybe it was only a one in 50 or one in 100 chance of getting is literally impossible because well, let's say it has multiple of killing off one of your characters or resources all in a row that there was supposed to be like four in a large deck and all four of them were on top. And it's just like, that's just a case of like, well, I just wasted like 30 minutes to an hour yeah. setting it up and however long it took to play through that part and literally there was nothing we could have done so i do appreciate that kind of design where you know what's going to happen and there's only smaller order shifts you know if it's good or bad and you can't have it stack up like that or at the bottom where you just win <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's true all right well i am excited to get my copy when does it come out it doesn't come out till it's come out this year or next year 
next uh, year, August about next year. year from now. About a year from, from wow. now. No, no, sorry, on the Gen Con. Yeah, the Gen Con is, uh, is the time. This I year's Gen Con or next side. year's? This year's or next year's Gen Con? So no, next, August, next year. tw- August 25, we should, oh, should be yeah. estimated. Oh, the man. Yeah. I got to wait another year to play. All right. I yeah, mean, we, yeah. ne- we need to test the game more and more and more and more. And that's why we're also, this is very helpful with the Kickstarter. Uh, it's it, it, obviously easier to get the money there, but it's also way easier to get people interested in and having more playtesters, having nice more uh, work done, and ultimately de- delivering just a better game, just that the core game yeah. and, the, and everything we create will be top-notch. Got it. Well, send send me a copy. I'll break the crap out of it for you. And I'll send you <laughs> detailed reports of, how, of what I did. <laughs> so you can fix it. So people don't do what I did. But uh, no, I liked it a lot. I was very impressed. And it was just, again, I, I, I don't think people will ever get bored of putting passengers in the coffins. That, I, think that, <laughs> I think you can make a side game of that. I think that could be its own game. It Design so your fun. own coffin game. It's really fun. Well, because the, the coffin... Oh, yeah, three you have two red passengers. Well, because the coffins fit coffin. perfectly. They per- they fit right over them. And they're like, oh! It's it's just like uh, it's so super well. Just fine. It's super It's super tight. It's like just... Per- and you don't know. And you can barely tell. Because you're like, what are those little brown things? And then they put them on. And mm-hmm. you're like, oh, they're dead. That's great. <laughs> It's so much fun. That was the best part. The and and actually the vampire, the vampire hanging on the side of the train, going across the train, like looking in on you. That was fun too. Uh, it, it's and you very, can see him through the window. Right, you see him through the window, and you literally see the vampire through the window. And I like closing the windows. That was fun too. So it was. Uh, it's Great. very them- th- thematic. Uh, I, I you don't see that too much. I think people are so enamored with minis. And I'm kind of sick of minis because it's like minis are fine, but they take up a lot of space and they're heavy and they're bulky and they're pointy and you get sharp edges and you get cut on your. I mean, it's like I've gotten cut on so many minis it drives me crazy. And I was like, I was like, okay, here we, it's literally just cardboard, a cardboard train. And I was like, that's all you needed, man. You don't need to go crazy. We didn't need to have some big, huge train of plastic although you do have a, a kickstarter bonus of a ghost of the ghost train plastic ghost train which i like that I yeah but it's the big yeah. uh it's uh, for the train mini for the right. one that goes on the train tracks yeah. right right yeah. right you don't do anything with it other than it tells the time of like where you are in the in yeah. the in the voyage so but you see you must have done a good game because I played it once and I practically I, I knew the rules. I don't even know. Even I don't know how I knew the rules that well. So. <laughs> and I haven't watched a video or anything. I literally I just played it once at one time. So good job. Okay, this is what <laughs> circling back to the very beginning. Uh, this is uh, one way of making the game more approachable, but also translating the medium. Uh, most of the design and most of the rules we've made are based on like tr- translating the narrative uh, for the players. So like with the coffins, from your daily life, you sort of know what coffins are for. Like they're for people. They're like, <laughs> they're, there is no like weird use for them. There's no like weird thing. You have a passenger, they die, you put a coffin. There's a vampire, you close the window, uh, you close the blinds, the curtains, it's dark in the room, the vampire prefers the darkness and so on and so on. So, even though there is a, a, a few rules there, uh, all of them are very much thematically tied. So it's easy to get into them and easy to remember them because they are there for a reason and they serve always some purpose. Yeah, it's just more intuitive to, to learn that way. Mm-hmm. Well, you can't always do that, though. Like yours is based on planet Earth, but then you have like Nemesis, which is not. So you can't always... <laughs> I mean, people have. Uh, I, I'll answer for Adam, even though <laughs> he designed the game. Uh, people have watched so many uh, science fiction movies. They they know uh, aliens. Like this is one thing I hate when I watch a movie about zombies or something. 
And the, the heroes in the movie are like, Ooh, what's happening? Come on, these are zombies. We've all watched movies. We've played games. We've read books. We know what zombies are. Like, I've not, never met them before, but the concept is not foreign to me. No, so maybe, the maybe. expectations do not need to come from, like, proper, like, my, my own life experience. It could be from the stories I've read or I've seen. True. But maybe in those universes, they don't have zombies. So then it's just the whole genre savvy <laughs> thing of like oh, yeah. when you actually have a character who's genre savvy and understands what's going on there, it can be a big benefit for them. But sometimes the stories they want to tell uh, as an author is something that they can't tell if the character was genre savvy because they have to do foolish stuff. That's true. That's right. Yeah, you can't assume that yeah, like every know. single horror movie, let's split. <laughs> no, don't. Please don't. For <laughs> once. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. Actually, for so long too, and uh, going through every aspect of this game. There's nothing left. There's nothing left. Although, let me know when you figure out how I can play the train, because I want to try that out. <laughs> yeah, we, we will. We will remember uh, that one. <laughs> <laughs> that would. That would. That's. I don't even know what the goal would be if you're the train. I guess to get to get to the end. I don't know. Keep everyone alive. I don't know. That could be fun. That could Not be a... get lost in the dreamlands. Maybe. Can, who knows? Yeah, who knows? Yeah. See, it maybe never the train ends. would be one of the characters, and it's like navigating, and they have to like pick different places you can go all of which are bad but like try to pick one that's not but as you, bad as the other ones you, and that you can... coordinates with what the other players are trying to to do on that round it's like you know you can drive into this dream field and it's gonna be um it's gonna like corrupt essence i don't actually know what essence is so i just made that up um or you can drive over here but it's dark and the vampire is going to be more active and you have to pick because you're the train well, you can uh, go to the engine and speed up and slow down the train. So there are uh, there are there are ways to control the train in yeah. the game. So so all right, uh, do check out the Kickstarter. It's... Oh, we actually just hit six thousand backers. Oh, six thousand nice. backers! Oh, great! Wow, just <laughs> this very moment. <laughs> oh, look at that! Uh, well, minus is five thousand nine hundred ninety nine. Let me reset it. Better reset it. You have to see the six thousand. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot of backers in uh, just a yeah. few days. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. So good job. We're getting up on one thousand for ours. We have eight hundred seventy-three backers. So yes. and do check out ours as well. We have our secret. Yes, dragons. ours has a very mysterious forty-eight hour bonus that actually seems to last for over sixty soon. hours. And <laughs> I, uh, I, I launched our. We had a, we had some difficulties in the beginning and so i wanted to give people a little extra time yeah but it says it's a 48 okay. hour bonus and then it says it ends at a time that's 60 yeah, no hours one, from the original so yeah, people keep asking which no one, one is the, which one started. is true no one knows and no one knows when it started i don't know i when had it multiple started. people ask and all I've been right like, well Look, I it'll end soon don't worry they'll they'll won't be able to get You'll the bonus it. soon enough and no. then they'll they'll be out of luck forever so there you go it, it'll end soon enough um, I can end it anytime I want. I can just press a button and it's over. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> so all right, guys. Thanks. And then let, hopefully you uh, show up at Gen Con and then we can play this in person. And then you can be disappointed playing with people who've only played the game once or twice. And then you'll be like, <laughs> you're like, oh, guys, you're so slow at this. No, no, we Steven, just don't play uh, on proper difficulty. You can play the improper difficulty. Uh, <laughs> we will find the difficulty for you. Well, don't <laughs> no worry. Problem. You find it. I'm going to run around the train. I'm going to close all the windows. I'm going to make and run to the front of the car, make it speed four. I'm going to do everything in my power. I'm going to send all the people to the wrong you places. Know, no, no, we, we will do <laughs> something else we will let you play and you probably win and then in the rule book you will write okay and the difficulty what you are playing in this game is because of steven because he won the game for the first time and we have to make it right he's here there is his name please <laughs> I would love that. Oh, yeah, I would love to have a difficulty have named that. after me. That'd be great. Or <laughs> add a Steven character to the game that's like a Gilligan type person who just every time you're trying to do things, it's be like, no, this this character that's on the train is just Steven, and he changes the train speed up to four, even though you were trying to go slow. 
I, there's no, there's nothing wrong with that. Hey, man, like you need, you need, you need the random element. You need the randomness. That's what makes it fun. Otherwise, it's boring. <laughs> I, I definitely want to try that out. It's like, stop making the train go so fast. Stop changing the speed. We're all gonna die. <laughs> Yeah, but I like the coffins. I want to see more coffins on the train. They're fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, now you're up to 6,005 backers. Look at that. It's cranking along. Yeah, it's going fast. That's, it's going fast. True. All right. Well, yeah, thank you very much for having us here. Oh, sure. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks for joining. It was super, it was super, super fun here. Okay, cool. All right. I will uh, hopefully see you guys. And maybe when you come out with your next game, We'll come over and talk about. Oh, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I'm very excited. Or when you do another expansion for Nemesis or Frostpunk, and then you can figure out how to. Well, you seem to have a theme. All your games kill you. I'm starting to see it. I'm starting to understand oh, the concept. Well, only a couple of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, they're all Someday they're all deadly I will games. Make a game for tiles, and it will be more. Uh -huh. uh, more approachable for people not killing uh, everybody. So it's gonna make... everyone just gets knocked out. <laughs> knocked out <laughs> instead of dead. I don't know. If these are knocked all I'm out, really. And you go I, into yeah. these happy sleepy boxes. They're I not just coffins. noticed. Well, Nemesis and Frostpunk are all like super deadly. I was like, wait, I just noticed the theme. Every game yeah, will kill you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys.